Hi there. You're listening to One of Eight Billion, a podcast about all of us. I'm your host, Ivan Stegich. This podcast is supported by 107, a technology studio whose mission is to make things that matter. Online at 107.com. We all have a story, don't we? We've all had successes and failures, joy and disappointment, love and sadness. And yet, we've all made it to here, to right now. Our stories are one amongst eight billion others. Eight billion other stories, each of them unique, each of them grand in their own way, and each of them a window into the humanity that connects us all. One of eight billion tells life stories from around the world. Let's listen. Our story today is about Kamlaka Chandla, who has taken a long journey literally and figuratively, growing up in India and moving to the United States, and going from the grind of a corporate world to a life of creativity as a painter, sculptor, and poet. Let's listen. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell me your name and where you are in the world right now. My name is Kamlika Chandler, and I am in Edina, Minnesota right now. I have traveled across the world <laughs> to be here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the third location. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your now. So what does your everyday life look like these days? Life right now is very exciting. I feel like I have come back full circle from, you know, a lot of things that I did in my younger days are looping back in. And I think it's just fascinating. So I spend my time in ratios, if you will. So I paint. I'm a professional oil painter. I sculpt. So there's a lot of creative work. I teach, conducting workshops and weekly classes. But then the thing that is looped back is that I am also doing a bit of OD work, which is organizational development, leadership training, and life coaching, those kind of things, which I actually did back in my 20s. <laughs> so doing that again now, and I'm very excited. It's just part-time because art is really the anchor. That's what I do first and foremost, and the rest is built in based on the time and opportunity. That sounds amazing. So would you consider yourself then as a professional artist? Like that would be your title? Absolutely. I'd love to go for that title finally. In life. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. You're a professional artist. Tell me about the beginning of your life. Where were you born? What did that look like? Did you have any siblings at the time? When did that happen? Tell me a little bit about the start of your life. So my life really has been quite a roller coaster, but I am so grateful for that entire ride because that is what has made me what I am today. I was born in New Delhi in India, but I ended up staying in a small town, which was the British capital called Simla. It's up in the north in the state of Himachal Pradesh. It's just one of the hill stations that was very influenced by the British ways, if you will. And so that's where the first few years of school were until we moved to New Delhi, which is the capital. That was really my mom's idea to get us there. And she was biased because she was born in Delhi and she felt that the education system was not just British and it was a mix of everything. There was a more eclectic uh, and a more progressive idea of education in New Delhi. And that's where her roots were. So we moved there. I ended up going from New Delhi to another small town. And that's because I went to stay with my grand aunt. It was a bit of a rebel. <laughs> so at age 13, I grew up with two siblings, two brothers, one older, one younger. And, you know, life was fun. Everything was good, except I think 
I had to constantly understand how to find some method in the madness that I was given. It was pretty chaotic, including change as a constant factor. I think the way I could describe it best is my early years from age zero to seven were the most adventurous, most beautiful, have the loveliest memories, which include horse riding or just meandering around literally with my brother, with my older brother, walking back from school or roller skating or just being in theater and all of that. Very easy, cozy life. And then when we moved to Delhi, it was, I don't know if it's about, because I was coming of age or understanding a little more, I saw a lot of chaos around in my own limited understanding. And that made me want to actually leave my house. Unfortunately, after age seven through age 13, I would say were the most difficult years. And it made me want to leave home, regardless of how much fun it was to be with the brothers or... There's a lot of family drama, if you will. <laughs> and then I always wondered as a child that if these were the adults and if this is the idea of elders, then what else is beyond us? And where can I find my learning or inspiration or motivation? Because this is giving me an example of what I shouldn't be doing. In that regard, I was known as the little philosopher, you know, <laughs> Family and friends would often <laughs> say that, oh, she's a thinker and she's this and that. But anyway, so I was very drawn to philosophy at a very early age. And that rebellious instinct made me push my parents a little bit. And I said, well, I think I need to go because I have to become something in life. And if you guys are going to keep fighting, I don't think I'm going to get very far with that. They decided to send me to a grand aunt's house, actually because they did not agree or did not really appreciate the idea of being sent to a hostel. And I think that's partially because of the culture, which, you know, in my later years, I wondered over that how limited one can be or one's thinking can be just based on what you are surrounded by or the people or why it matters so much what people think of you or the society thinks and so on and so forth. Why wasn't it just about what is right or what is good for you, for good for the spirit. <laughs> right. Right. So I went there and they stopped me. They knew better than I, of course, that my aunt was this very, very tough taskmaster. She was a celibate. She was a spinster. She was a wonderful, very successful lady who had started multiple educational institutions. So she was very well known and reputable and all that. But she was a very tough disciplinarian. And little did I know, that's where I landed. Suddenly, <laughs> I had to swallow my pride and be like, oh, I made the decision. Now I better suck it up or whatever. I have to just be here because the pride didn't allow for me to say to my parents, oh my God, you were right. <laughs> Why don't you bring me back? But life was really hard. I thought my life was hard when I was with my immediate family. But I think the four years I spent there were really what made me very strong, they created this space and this big void, which today is, I think, a reservoir that I tap into for a lot of my strength, my inner struggles, my philosophy, or just silence. I think I'd learned my lessons in silence and resilience in those four years away from home. Also, just I think just so much was brought or put on the table for me, which I wasn't prepared for. And yet, that was just something that has given me so much. When did you start speaking English? What was your first experience with English? And what was the first language you spoke? I'm guessing that English wasn't, but... No, it is. It was, in fact, English as the first language. Because, yeah, because we were in Simla, which was known as summer capital of England. And all the schools we went to were started by the British. In fact, I went to a convent school run by Irish nuns. <laughs> they were, again, very strict. So Hindi, which is mother tongue, was actually just a language that was taught in school, just like French and Italian and German. But English was the medium of language, uh, of education. So everything was taught in that, whether it's math or history or geography. 
And uh, that was across for many years. I think even now in India, that's, you just grew up speaking English and then whatever regional language your family happens to be a part of. So that's the other thing about India. Every 50 kilometers, the language changes. But then there are these major languages, Punjabi, Gujarati, and Hindi is like a binder. Everybody pretty much knows Hindi. So that's like a universal thing. And how many do you speak? I can speak Hindi and a little bit of Punjabi in terms of the Indian languages. I understand French, Italian just a little bit. I can't say I know Italian well, but I can get by. We will get to that in Italian <laughs> in a little bit here, just a little bit. So you spent four years away from home. You were mm -hmm. in New Delhi. As you know, the name of our podcast is One of Eight Billion. And to me, I sometimes feel really connected to eight billion people and sometimes really disconnected. It's hard to get a sense of how big that number is. Maybe looking at the stars and maybe looking at the pictures from the James Webb Telescope, make it a little bit closer. But living in suburban and downtown Minneapolis, there's not a whole lot of overpopulation that I can see with my own eyes. Is that any different for you, for your experience living in India, home of one billion of those eight billion people? How does that change the perspective that you might have than I, that I have? Mm -hmm. You know, I think right from very early on, I was always very fascinated by what is beyond us and very interested in science. And in fact, I was the first, one of the first Indian ambassadors to be sent to NASA. And things like the supernova or just the, just metaphysics or the model of the universe. These were things that, these were the books I was reading at yeah. 13 and 14. But to your question about being one in eight billion, I feel that there is that sense of connectedness. It just doesn't stop to baffle me even today that we may seem we are unique. We may be different, but yet there is none like us. We have our own genotype. There's just one of us. And then at the same time, I think it grounds you because it helps you understand that the human essence is really the same across the 8 billion that we don't even see. We are inherently the same people at the core. And that's just something that life has taught me over and over again with my experiences while teaching or just traveling or understanding the human diaspora or the human sentiment. We're really similar <laughs> and yet very, very unique. So... Sitting in India, looking westward was often encouraged. In fact, I think that's one major thing that is changing now in the youth there. But when we were growing up, and now I tell these stories to my daughter and she laughs, but we were always told that everything westward was better. Mm -hmm. And there was a world beyond us right here where all the cultural influences were very strongly directed. I think that really helped us connect in an interesting way connect with the rest of the 8 billion through the music. <laughs> yeah. Growing up in South Africa, I completely understand that look westward. And yes. in South Africa, it was more of a look outward as mm. opposed to westward because it was in the bottom of Africa, far away from everything, isolated with sanctions. It was always mm. looking out with the rest of the world looking in. And you could go anywhere. You Well, you couldn't really go anywhere, but you could look anywhere. You could look towards the east and towards Australia, and you could look towards the north up to Europe and England, and you could look to the woods the west. I wonder what it was like for you. So you're in the United States, so you definitely went beyond India mm -hmm. and you went west, but did you look at the UK? Did you look elsewhere? When did you know that you weren't going to be in India and where did you want to be? Yeah, to be very honest, for me personally, it was never on the radar, even wanting, even the decision or the desire to move westward. I think just fast forwarding through school and then getting to university and then a very successful, nicely paying corporate job in Delhi. There was everything that I wanted and I desired for while being there as a youth. So I never thought about actually moving to America or England or anywhere. Going to England was something which was always encouraged because that's where apparently all the best universities were. If you were in the upper middle class in India, you had to go to Cambridge or Oxford or somewhere in London because that's what people did. That's where you got your education from. However, I think 
because I was doing well and I was happy and satisfied with at least very busy working, I never thought about it until 2007. There was a major life-changing episode, which kind of almost catapulted me into this decision of, okay, well, I am leaving everything. I'm going to move. I think my time in India is done. And that's when I started thinking for the first time that, you know what, after all, India is not for me. Maybe I should move to the Europe. And France was on the top of the list. Oh. I was actually going to go to Paris and I was going to move, go to L'Ecole des Beaux Arts, which is actually a school of arts. It's one of the most prestigious art schools. And when I was very busy churning 80 hours of work a week and feeling like, you know, all those philosophical notions had not escaped me that how much is enough? How far mm. does one go? And how much money will be enough? What more titles do I need? And relationships or failed relationships or what is there beyond us? When I think I was at that point in my life where I had truly understood the Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. and I was focusing on self-actualization at a very young age and people thought I was crazy. It's too philosophical and too wise and too mature for my age and it's not good for me. <laughs> so it's at that time when I just felt I, I need to go, I need to move. And there were other, of course, very personal reasons that also made me think about it. 2008 is when I moved to the U.S. And that was not for work or studying. That was not the plan. But I got married. And that was how I ended up here because my husband couldn't travel to India or come see me. It was the other way around. You know, usually in the Indian culture, the guy comes to see the girl. But I wasn't working out. So I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to come see you. How about that? Yeah, that's where I visited Chicago, and that's where I met my husband. He tricked me into it, of course. He's like, oh, why don't you just get married now and so that you don't have to go back? And I was like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. I have to go back, wind up my projects. There's plenty to be done. But yeah, you know, that's, that's really how it happened. It wasn't because I wanted to be in the U.S., to be very honest. <laughs> So it was quite serendipitous is what it was. It happened through the series of circumstances. What were you actually doing before that required you to work 80 hours a week? That doesn't right. sound like a lot of fun. What was that you were doing? <laughs> yeah, I started working really early. I was about 18. The, my education was in psychology. And I had done a little bit of mentorship work with the UNDP. I had started a nonprofit organization with a bunch of young people. So there, was doing, there were a lot of things that I was doing at the time. But then I took up a serious job and just never looked back. And when you finally arrived in Chicago and got married, did you guys end up staying in Chicago? How long were you there yes. before you ended up here in Minnesota? Yeah, so my husband actually used to stay in Chicago already, and he was there since early 2000, and I joined him in 2008. And then after that, we've jumped, skipped, and hopped around the country. He's in the healthcare system, so it just takes him, it has taken him around. We've moved from Chicago to Sacramento to Salt Lake City, and then we're back in the Midwest, which I'm very happy about. So not Chicago, but a little short of it. You know, they say Minnesota grows on you, and it sure has. And there are no plans <laughs> to move anywhere. I see from your LinkedIn that you studied at the University of Chicago and also at the University of Illinois, Chicago. That's where your applied psychology and psychology experience comes from. And yet you are a professional artist. And <laughs> I, will, I would love to hear how you went from studying psychology uh -huh. and working in these fields to deciding that, you know what, I'm going to follow my passion and I'm going to spend time and be a professional oil painter. How did that transition happen? Oh, well, it sounds like an easy question, but there's a lot wrapped in there. You know, I was always very interested in human psychology and human behavior, especially from just the family. And so I actually went to University of Delhi first. 
and studied psychology there. Mm. And then when I came to the U.S. in 2008, that was after working in the corporate sector, doing leadership work and motivation and strategy and implementation, those kind of things. And it was very satisfying. You are contributing to the backbone of an organization. You're really building on the core values and vision and mission. All those kind of things were very satisfying, but yet it seemed like tactics. It seemed like, what do you do to make people feel good about their roles, even if there is nearly nothing much there? So there was a lot of that. And then there was a bit of that philosophical thing in me that, okay, what is the meaning and purpose of all of this? And then that was very demanding which to answer your previous question about the 80 hours, it was just whatever you could give. And I think organizations sucked every ounce from me and mm. it was never enough. Uh, it was very satisfying. I was sincerely applauded and appreciated mm. for what I did. I was good at it. But I think at that point or by that point, I had already given up on my idea or dreams of becoming a scientist or becoming a psychologist. Some bit of it I had already given up, but then again, so just just by pure chance or serendipity, as you called it, when I moved to the U.S., instead of transferring back into OD, my husband's paperwork didn't allow me to work. And that was such a blow for someone like me who was very used to just being independent and doing mm -hmm. my own thing. And now here I am in a country after having achieved all of that, suddenly I, I'm not allowed to work okay, what am I supposed to do? How do I wind the clock back? It doesn't make sense. So the two options I had were either volunteer or study. So I think just my love for education just made me go back. That's how I found my entry back into the University of Illinois. I used to do independent research. I did applied psychology. And I think just the joy of going through all of that education all over again, I think was initially I questioned it, but then I was so grateful because the kind of subjects and what I studied here, I think that was the first time I really studied anything with such interest and enthusiasm. And I think that receptivity, if you will. So that's how it really happened. And I was on the track of doing my PhD. I had a very supportive mentor, Dr. Betty Bottoms. She was the dean of the Honors College, who was very encouraging, very appreciative again. And then I felt it was so easy to be a 4.0 student here. It's so easy to get scholarships. It's just, you just, all you have to do is apply. And I think coming in as a more mature student among the other 18-year-olds, I was the 28-year-old among all of them. It just felt a little odd, but again, it made it very easy. I think I was more ready and more curious, more appreciative of the knowledge that I was getting. And then again, I was still on the track of being in psychology, and that's what took me to the University of Chicago, where I did my internship and I studied comorbid disorders, worked with the pediatric oncology department. And I think along the way, I somewhere in almost about in 2012, when I was wanting to be a mom and have my own child, or, you know, I think something changed. And something reminded me that I'm doing the same battle all over again. Like the, these immediate accolades of the title and more, more accolades or more growth or more money or how is this directly impacting the people that I meet? And you know how it is in universities, you are trying to be published in academic journals. And I was doing that too. But the question always bothered me. Where is this all going to go? And right from when I was a child, in Asia, you're not allowed to be an artist. Just for the mm. record, you cannot do something vocational. It's if you choose to be an artist or a creative person, a musician, that means either you're not intelligent enough or there's, there's definitely some issue there. How many creatives have been stifled by that? And how many great I artists have we not seen because of that? I think an easy billion. How awesome that you could pursue that. Yes, I think it was that quest and that fire. And I said, that's what America gave me. When I moved here for the first time in my life, I understood the meaning of liberty, the meaning of freedom, the meaning of being your own person. And the only thing I told myself was, if I can't do or I can't be who I want to be in this country, then shame on me. The onus is on me. Now I cannot say the society didn't let me do this or my parents didn't let me do this or this and that or the other. It, it was really about me finding myself and being who I really was. 
I think that's where I took a very deep dive and plunge into it and said, you know, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do whatever it takes to be the kind of artist that I want to be. And it's not going to be an easy journey. It wasn't easy to give up a consistent job or some money coming in. But I think I was ready, I think philosophically ready. And I think in that way or in some sense, that was really a renunciation of sorts for me personally or spiritually that I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to give in to this creative process, which is a privilege, a deep privilege. What was the first piece of a creative work you remember thinking to yourself and then realizing that this is something you made professionally that mm -hmm. maybe sold or that maybe was in an exhibition? Do you remember the first things that you could identify with that you could definitely say, oh, I'm a new person in a new career? I knew that if I wanted to learn, if I wanted to be an artist, I would definitely have to learn. And this is the big problem with anything creative, right? When people think, well, for becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist, you have to spend the time and money and the energy, but you're supposed to be born an artist and you don't have to put in any work. So I think I was very clear about that idea of how hard I will have to work or where will I have to go with this journey. But you'll be surprised. My first few pieces that I made were actually back in India while I was working 80 hours a week. And it told me that I wanted to be an artist when I was maybe five, but I, since I was just not allowed to be one, but I still found myself doing that after those 80 hours of work into the night coming in and working, still painting or still working. So those were very abstract pieces, very powerful pieces. You'll be surprised. Those are the pieces that sold when I brought them back here. Really? Right away. Not the ones that I had spent 80 hours on very skillfully, <laughs> but more of the <laughs> Yeah, that was the irony of it, <laughs> that the pieces that were more abstract and wild and probably a little more raw, which came from a place of originality and absolute expressionism, I think they were very emotional pieces. I think a lack of a proper craft or a skill. And, you know, my first piece that sold here was definitely something that I was very proud of. There were a bunch of roses painted in the Flemish method, the Flemish technique, requiring a lot of skill, a lot of time and understanding into conservation and preservation of art, not just painting something from an idea of expressing or pouring out, or not as an outlet, but actually a piece of skill and craft. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's what made me proud or which made me feel down the line when I sold portraits of people started reaching out and saying, would you paint a picture of our child or our grandchild? And I think those few first few years, first few pieces, just getting commissions from mothers or to be mothers and existing children. And I think that just made me give my best. Even till this day, anybody who who reaches out and says, I'd love for you to paint a picture for us, whether it's of a beautiful sunset or of their child or their grandchild or for a special anniversary or whatever. I think it just, it, I always have the same reaction. I just feel very grateful and I feel like I'm adding a piece of me and a piece of all the sensibilities that connect all the 8 billion of us, that creative energy, which I feel I'm very lucky to tap into. And letting others be a part of that. I think that's just how I take it. And I feel like I have such a long way to go. I'm still waiting for myself for that masterpiece. <laughs> it's <laughs> not made yet. It's not been made yet. <laughs> Art is never finished, is it? It's never You're finished. always working on it. It's always something that could be yeah. changed and evolved and improved and destroyed in some cases too. Oh, absolutely. I think the interesting part of every creative person's journey is that even though in the early ages or stages that it may have been that idea of pain into passion, but what happens mm -hmm. along the way, along the journey is when that in itself, the process turns into joy and you're driving from it, you're gaining from it as much as you're giving into it. So it's just, I think it's that tipping point, it's that realization when the pain turns into joy in, in any creative person's life. I think that's what we're all really going for, whether it's a musician, artist, or someone who's very proud of whatever they do. Absolutely. Even in science, we're not done, right? There's always that frontier that we're pushing. We understand a finite amount, and then we go mm -hmm. onto the edges and we learn more, and we just are honing the craft in science too. So Absolutely. I, I totally understand. 
So you're a professional painter. We've talked about this. You have a background in psychology. At the beginning, you told me about how this organizational development is coming back into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask about that in just a second. But before I ask about that, I want to ask you about your recent trip to Italy and your work (laughs) in Florence. And tell me a little bit about that, because that is creative, but it's not related to your painting. It's relating to something else. Yes. I think the one thing that keeps me going is a realization by now. You know, I turned 40 last year and something happened, something changed. But what has never changed is this idea of continuous learning and improvement. So I was in Italy for for sculpture, for sculpting, the portrait and the figure. And it's a new skill. It's a new craft. The idea may be the same, but it's just a whole different slew of techniques and skill. And it's very physical, very manual. And the idea of using all those tools and drills and armatures and wires was so intimidating to me for all these years while I was painting. I wanted to turn the corner in oil painting before I picked up a new skill. I think that's really just the truth about why I waited so long to sculpt is because I wouldn't have been able to give my all in honing a craft if I did too many things at the same time. So that was really what took me there. A bit of learning, a bit of teaching, a bit of an opportunity to assist and to learn at the same time. Very grateful. And, you know, these are the things when I look back and I made that decision as a young, whatever, even if this journey has not been that long, I think it just reminds me that I was so fortunate and so right to have taken the plunge when I did and made that decision. There is no going back from once you have tapped into that very beautiful space, which is both inner and out and in very in sync with everything else. So yeah, that's what Italy was all about. Sounds <laughs> Long- amazing. It was very, that's very grateful. Great. Now tell me a little about how you are enjoying bringing organizational development OD back into the work you're doing now. And how have you changed it and molded it based on the experience you've learned over the last 20 years? I truly believe that no education, no life experience ever goes waste, whether it's personal or professional. And so all that OD or that corporate experience that I had is definitely something. But then what life taught me and what university taught me and what my personal philosophy today is, I think all of that today at 40, I'm a richer, wiser, more holistic person. And what I can contribute today, whether it's for a small organization or a bigger firm, is a collection, is a collective of all of that experience and understanding, which I am able to do in a more confident way. And I think over the years, what has been a very humbling experience, even when I walked away from the corporate world almost 16 years ago, I, till this day, there, has, there, there hasn't been a week that has passed when someone has not called me, either a previous mentor or a boss or a colleague or someone who has a successful startup in the Silicon Valley today or other friends who've started with their own nonprofits and this and that, who've always reached out and said, we wanted to pick your brain on this idea or on leadership or how do you manage teams? How do you encourage someone? How do you motivate someone? And I think that job never changed. I think for me, I kept doing that even though I wasn't paid for it all these years. <laughs> I've always been a counselor. I've always been a friend. I've always been that person that people have called. Finally, it made me feel like, why not? And COVID changed the world. COVID changed a lot Didn't of it? small business. Oh, yes. man. Especially small businesses and creative people. You know, we took a hit and we realized more than ever that if we do not get the kind of respect or remuneration for what we do, then how do we share our stories? How do we change the world? How do we teach them how to respect artists and writers and musicians and all those people who do not have a corporate to go to, who have who are people working from their own homes, their own basements or their own dungeons. And when will they become part of the category of people who are also equals? You know, so I think we just have such a long way to go. And I hate to share this, but I just somewhere down the line know that whether I get commissions or not for painting, I will always have a steady job when it comes to the corporate world. I wish that wasn't the truth. I wish that wasn't the reality. But it is. I can always jump back into the corporate world and get paid without any questions. But we don't do the same for people who are doing their own thing or, or it's just not as much money. And there is a difference. 
we have a long way to go in helping people understand what we do so for sure i think this might be one of my final questions we've just had such a good time talking to you i wanted to just change the mood a little bit and ask you about your greatest struggle in life i often ask this question as part of the podcast and it's a way to just remind ourselves where we're at and that we're all human and i'd love to hear you describe yours if you have Mm -hmm. one Yes, absolutely. I can even probably share it in in the format of a poem if you're okay with it. Of course, yes. Life for life. It goes on as though it has a will of its own. Shows us plenty, but keeps enough unknown. Sorrow, mystery, joy, passion and pain. Lessons on it all, just to die one day in vain. Perhaps it's all about the small chapters the little things, the moments, the few friends, the beautiful children we born, for watching the sunrise, hearing the night, taking in the fragrance of flowers, our struggles and goals, our darkest truths and lies, the agony of illness, impermanence, the pretense and the frivolity of it all, the void, the burning passion, mortality, and the pulsating life itself inside. We just have to learn to let it all be, Walk a little more, focus on what we believe. There's no reason, no motive, no purpose, no need after a while. And yet we must accept, perhaps filter, listen, let go and befriend our deeper self inside. Then on repeat, watch, observe, learn, love and live, share, laugh, reflect and continue to give. Wow, thank you. We've definitely never had a poem, an original poem on the podcast, and your creativity shines through in every kind of medium. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's so true. Like There is no reason. There is no rhyme. It's just ourselves repeating and doing it over and over again and learning. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. It's been so great talking to you. I am so glad that we know each other and that we were able to spend this time learning more about you and your story as one of 8 billion. And I thank you for everything you bring to the show and everything that you've brought to my daughter, Eva, who you, know, you are her teacher. She's, she's your student. So very grateful for that as well. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much, Ivan. It's really my pleasure. And, you know, a note about Eva, I think, you know, that's the future right ahead of you. She's such a joy. And, you know, I I feel like there are no great teachers. They are just great students. They they draw out of you. That's really the truth. (laughs) So she's such a joy. Thank you so much. I hope you'll join us in the next episode of One of Eight Billion when we hear from Dr. P.Z. Myers, a biologist and founder of the Feringula Science Blog, a site aimed at promoting independent thinking and individual autonomy. One day we had an egg sac hatch out and I opened up the container in the lab. This was before I knew all the details of taking care of spiders and they started ballooning out and the lab was full of all these little tiny baby spiders hanging from threads and it was magical, yeah. This has been One of Eight Billion, a podcast about all of us, online at oneof8b.com. Join us again next time as we listen to One of Eight Billion Other Stories. One of 8 Billion is supported by 107, a technology studio whose mission is to make things that matter. Find out more at 107.com. I'm Ivan Stegich. Thank you for listening.